Hello everyone and welcome back to AP US History Review. We've got a lot to cover today. We're covering 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, and 3.4 in your APUSH textbook. So we'll be covering in those topics, the topics of contextualizing period three, the seven years war, taxation without representation, and philosophical foundations of the American Revolution. Let's get right into it. Welcome back to APUSH Review. Today we're going to be going over period three, specifically topics 3.1 to 3.4. Our main, main ideas here are contextualizing period three, the Seven Years' War, taxation without representation, and philosophical foundations of the American Revolution. So first of all, we got to give this period some context. Now what you need to know is that the British colonies began to develop an individualistic identity from Great Britain. Now we talked about this a little bit at the end of period two, but it's it's coming all together right now. They soon achieved their independence. We have the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and the Revolutionary War and everything else in this period. So the major causes of that revolution, the American Revolution, were British's har uh, like Britain's harsher rule of the colonies, the impact of European affairs and ideas, and the rise of American revol leaders and people who wanted self-government. Now, the first major conflict during this period is the Seven Years' War. So there was a series of wars which took place between these major European powers, like Britain, France, and Spain. Now, Great Britain and France especially recognized the value of the colonies because they were like, wait a minute, there's all this fur trade, there are all these raw materials in the colonies, and since everyone was going off of mercantilism at the time, they were like, we got to stay here. So the final war in the series was known as the Seven Years' War. It was also known as the French and Indian War. Now, if you ask the French why they decided that they wanted to fight this war, it's because the French were getting twitchy over the English encroachment on their territory. But the English were also getting, like, if you ask the English, they'd say that they're getting twitchy over the French encroachment. Because the, in the Ohio River Valley, there was this fort which French soldiers, French colonists took over and then Washington barged in and he was like, get out of here. And then the French came back with more soldiers and took it back from Washington. And that was basically the start of this massive conflict. Now the time frame was 1754 to 1763. The French and Native Americans were against the British and the British colonies. Okay, this is not to be confused that the French were against the Native Americans. Now, the war started off really badly for the British. Like, their expeditions were defeated, the Native Americans ravaged the con colonial frontier, and the French stopped the invasion of French Canada. Then we have the Albany Plan of Union. Now, this was developed by our boy Ben, and he provided the system for recruiting troops and collecting taxes from various colonies for their common defense of the colony. It was, it was basically calling for unity throughout all the colonies, and this was all discussed in the Albany Congress in New York. It never took effect. That's something that you need to know. So every state, every colony, they wanted to preserve their own taxation powers, and the taxing rights that they'd have to give away just stunk horribly to, to all of them. British, like Britain eventually won this conflict. Um, they concentrated their military strategy on conquering Canada, and they were successful in their endeavors. So they negotiated a treaty called the Treaty of Paris, not to be confused with the Peace of Paris, which was to end the American Revolution, in 1763. Britain got control of French Canada and Spanish Florida from the treaty, and French, uh, the French gave up the Louisiana Territory to Spain. Some of the effects of the war included that it gave Britain unchallenged supremacy in North America, it challenged the autonomy of American Indians, and they just made the British the dominant naval power. Now, we also had a really massive change in how Britain and the colonies viewed each other. The British view of the war was that the American militia sucked and they were poorly trained. And then they also thought that the colonists were unable and unwilling to defend the frontier of the British Empire. Now, the colonists, on the other hand, they were proud of their performance. They were, they were so happy. They were like, we did so well in that. No training, no nothing. And they were not impressed with British leadership. There was a massive reorganization of the British Empire after the war. British, the British government viewed colonies with a lot more resent after the war. Now, this period of salutary neglect, which was where Britain basically ignored the colonies, um, was over. There were more stricter, forceful policies which are enacted in this period. The first major conflict, or like the first post-Seven-Year-War uh, conflict, was Pontiac's Rebellion. 
the Native Americans, uh, led by Pontiac, realized that, wait a minute, these guys are going to come into our land and just take it from us. We can't let that happen. Now, Pontiac's alliance of Native American Indians destroyed forts and settlements in the colonies, and it led to Britain having to send in troops to stop Pontiac and his friends. Um, and it led to the British passing the Proclamation of 1763, which basically said, you colonists cannot settle west of the Appalachian Mountains. The colonists were very angry, and they defied that and did not listen to it at all. Many of them continued westward, in the thousands, actually. The next major concept that we have is taxation without representation. Colonists could not directly elect reps to par parliament. They had this thing called virtual representation, according to Britain, which was that people in parliament represented every social class, but not necessarily every geographical location, which the colonists did not really agree with. Britain just pushed those complaints aside and were like, you guys have virtual representation, don't worry about it. New revenues and regulations of the colonies were enforced by Parliament, such as the Sugar Act, the Quartering Act, and the Stamp Act. The Sugar Act was 1764. It taxed foreign sugar and certain luxuries. The Quartering Act was mostly aimed towards merchants at this point in time, and it was where colonists had to provide food and living quarters for British soldiers. The Stamp Act was also in 1765, and it was to help raise funds for British military paper. It was the first major direct tax on people because it required tax stamps on most printed paper in the colonies. Now, what, what did this look like? It was newspapers, legal documents, birth certificates, death certificates, all of those kinds of things. Then we have the Stamp Act colonial reaction. So there was a Stamp Act Congress, and it argued how only their own elected reps, like the colonists' own elected reps, had the authority to approve taxes. It led to the formation of Sons and Daughters of Liberty, which was a secret society with the purpose of intimidating tax agents. Oftentimes, they went ahead and kind of tarred them and put them, put feathers on them, which was kind of extreme, but I get where they're coming from. And it, they destroyed the revenue stamps. They boycotted against British imports, and the Stamp Act was eventually repealed, but not without consequences. We had the Declaratory Act in 1766, which basically said, the British Parliament had the right to tax and make laws in all circumstances whatsoever. Now, this is really extreme. It's like the Parliament saying, well, we'll take it away. Like, like we'll, we'll give you back your stuff, but we still have the right to do that in the future, <laughs> which is a threat that they do make good on with the Townshend Acts in 1767. Now, these were taxes and duties on colonial imports of tea, glass, and paper. It provided for the search of private homes for smuggled goods, which really was just you had to have a writ of assistance any official just had to have this like piece of paper which said oh this person is certified to go ahead and search any home any private property this is not like a warrant it isn't property specific it's just you have this you can go wherever you want the colonies accepted them at first but they soon started protesting them now, some of these forms of protest were through the Massachusetts Circular Letter, which urged colonies to petition the Parliament to repeal the Acts, and British officials overlooked the documents and threatened the colonists. In response, colonists again boycotted British goods. As you can see, it's not a very effective strategy to not allow them representation. These Acts were eventually repealed in 1770. After that, we have the Boston Massacre. Now, this was where a crowd of colonists harassed guards stationed at a custom house and the guards fired into the crowd, with five colonists being killed. Now, some of these guards didn't get charged with murder. Fun fact, uh, John Adams was actually their lawyer, and he got most of them acquitted. And it increased the colonists' anti-British sentiment. Now we have the Boston Tea Party in 1773. Colonists continued to refuse to buy British tea, which was taxed. Now, this, this happened because of the Tea Act in 1773, which granted the British East India Company a monopoly over tea in the colonies. A shipment of British East India Tea Company tea arrived in the Boston Harbor, and Bostonians dressed up as American Indians and dumped 342 chests of tea in the harbor. Um, now we have the Intolerable Acts, which was kind of a response to the Boston Tea Party. So it came in two ways, the Coercive Acts and the Quebec Acts. The Coercive Acts came in 1774, and it was a series of punitive acts by the British government after the Boston Tea Party. The first one was the Port Act. It closed the port of Boston until the destroyed tea was paid for. 
Then there was the Massachusetts Government Act, which reduced the power of the Massachusetts legislator and gave more of that power to the royal governor. Then we have the Administration of Justice Act, which basically allowed royal officials in the colonies to get off scot-free because they had to be tried in Great Britain. Uh, so a lot of the laws that, that were in the colonies didn't really apply to them because they could just go back to Great Britain where those laws did not exist and get tried for them, which would lead to nothing. Then the Quartering Act was expanded to enable British troops to stay in private homes as well, not just the homes of merchants. The Quebec Act took away lands that certain colonies claimed along the Ohio River, and it gave it to the French Canadians. It also said the national religion of Quebec was Catholicism. And that was really, really odd because, see, British was Protestant, and all of us know that. So to the colonists, it felt like, what are they doing? What is Parliament doing? Like, what could they possibly do to us as a result of this? So the colonists started getting scared. Now, more of these colonists were actively expressing their anger and disapproval of Britain's policies towards them. Then we have the philosophical foundations of the American Revolution. The era of the Enlightenment was at its peak, so the ideas of the American Revolution reflected the Enlightenment thinking. Some of these ideas included deism, rationalism, and the idea of a social contract. Now, deism is the idea that God sets the rules and then allowed people to make their own choices. Rationalism is an emphasis on human reasoning, on combating social problems uh, and societal problems, rather than explicitly thinking about the Bible literally. Social contract was the idea that people could form a government to promote liberty and equality, and it give up some of their rights for protection of other of their rights, and it disapproved of the monarchs ruling over people. One of the biggest documents that you need to know for this period is Common Sense by Thomas Paine. It said that colonies should become independent states, and it stated that it did not make sense for colonies to be ruled by such a small, distant land, which was Britain. It was a key factor in increasing the divide between the colonies and Great Britain. A key thing to note about Thomas Paine was that he came to the colonies after being born and brought up in Britain. So he formed his own opinions even after he was brought up in Britain. So he knew what was going on and he brought up this very nice point. Common sense also broke down these massive ideas into simple language which a layman could understand, which was really crucial to spreading the sentiment to everybody. And that's all we have for today. See you in the next one.